Freedom is not free. It costs somebody something. First Corinthians chapter number 16. First Corinthians 16, we're to the last chapter. What about that? And because I don't want to quit, I think I'll preach about 10 messages out of this last chapter. I can't let it go. <clears throat> first Corinthians 16, the first four verses of the chapter. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letter, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet or fitting that I go also, they shall go with me. Now Malachi chapter number 3, and you don't have to turn there, I can just read it. It says this, verse number 7, even from the days of your fathers you're gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. You'll note in Malachi 3 8, there's that little statement in verse number 8 in tithes and offerings. Those two things are what we're going to look at today. The 16th chapter of 1 Corinthians brings us to the subject of giving. I'd begin with a little paragraph like this. Your financial giving can make you an overseas missionary without ever leaving your hometown. It can make you an evangelist without ever mounting a pulpit. It can make you a gospel broadcaster without ever entering a radio station. It can make you a Bible teacher without ever writing a book. How? By financially giving to God's work. Let's study and see what the Bible says about it, what God's Word says about tithes and offerings and about giving today. Before we delve into the 16th, 1 Corinthians 16 text, we have to look first at tithing. Because 1 Corinthians 16 has to do with offerings. But what about tithing? What is a tithe? It is the Greek word, dekate. It means a tenth. It comes from the root word, deca, ten. The number ten. So, Hebrews 7, 2 translates it, a tenth part of all. That's the phrase. But a tenth part is the word. A tenth part of all. Three more times in that same chapter, Hebrews chapter number 7, in verse number 6, verse 8, verse 9, we find the word tithes. The same word as is translated 
a tenth part. A tithe. Somebody says, oh, well, you know, I tithe, but I only tithe. I, 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 my tithe is 5%. No, then you don't tithe. Tithing is 10%. Tithing is giving one-tenth of your income to God. And I would emphasize before I'm said and done here, through the local church. God's house. A dime out of every dollar. A dollar out of every ten dollars. Ten dollars out of every hundred dollars. And a hundred dollars out of every one thousand dollars is a tithe well there are some people who say well you know a person should just give what they feel is right for them to give you know that's a haphazard way of giving this morning it really is what if hardly anybody felt like giving this year <laughs> that's what happened in Nehemiah's day Nehemiah chapter 13 says that the tithe was to come in and when the tithe came in it took care of the Levites and those who were ministering at the house of God and those who were ministering at the house of God had to go out and do secular work and were told that the house of God was forsaken and the ministry at the house of God was forsaken. Why? Then God tells why. He rebukes them. He said because you have not The tithe was to go to the Levites and to the temple there in the Old Testament for ministry, for spiritual ministry, to daily workings that were taking place in the life and through the life of that assembly. So, think about this. God builds this church. God calls for preachers and uh, people to start churches. What kind of a God would he be if he set up a church, but he set up no particular method for financing that church? What if he gives the Great Commission to us, but sets up no specific way to finance it? What about it? He, he, he says, oh, just adopt the attitude, whatever you feel like. You, you just feel like, you, you just give whatever you feel is right for you. No. He sets up tithing. And it's fair. You, you know why it's fair? Somebody makes a bunch of money and they give their 10%. It's a percentage basis. And then somebody doesn't hardly make any money and they can only give just a little tad. But it's fair. I, I would hasten to say this. I don't mean to just cast a, a blanket or a, a condemnation of that kind of thing. Uh, like take for instance, I know, I know of women through the years, their husband's the primary breadwinner or is the breadwinner in the home. And the husband isn't saved or won't go to church, whatever. And the wife can't, can't force him to give a tithe. Right? So, I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. But I am saying that if you're a breadwinner and a child of God and a member of this assembly, you need to tithe. So, let's look at three periods. Tithing and three periods in the Bible. Tithing before the law. Tithing before the law. God gave the law to Moses, right? But before then, there are two events, two places, where tithing is mentioned. It's mentioned in the life of Abraham. It is also mentioned in the life of Jacob. Uh, Genesis chapter number 14. We're told that 500 years before the law. 500 years before the law of Moses is given. Abraham ties to the king of Salem who is the priest of the Most High God. 
He gives to the work of God. Now let me say, it's not mandatory. It was voluntary. It wasn't, it, it wasn't demanded of him. There's no law about it yet. That we know of anyway. That's recorded. So Abraham gives. And then Jacob, later on, he promises to give in Genesis 28. He says he's going to give tithes. He's going to give a tenth of all and so on. There's no, I see no record that he did. He might have. But there's no record that he did. So it's mentioned there. So that's tithing before the law. Before God gave the law. Then what about tithing under the law? There's tithing in the Old Testament under the law given to Moses in Leviticus chapter 27. Let me read the passage, verse number 30 and 32. Listen to it. It says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the land, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Verse 32, And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. We have an agricultural people, right? They're farmers and they grow uh, and, and they have cattle, sheep and so on. And they're to tithe off of that. It's not monetary, but it's still tenth a tenth of all a tenth of all if they're if they increase this year and uh, they have a hundred lambs have gained a hundred lambs how many are they supposed to give to the Lord ten yeah that's right what if they had ten lambs only had ten lamb increase this year yeah they just give one ten percent and we're told there, all the tithe is the Lord's. It's holy unto the Lord. And verse 32, and concerning the tithe, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. That is, set apart. Holy. Set apart. There's nothing necessarily holy about a, a sheep. <laughs> you know, can be pretty stinky. <laughs> but it's set apart for God is the idea. So the Lord claims ownership. Of the tithe. Ten percent of your income is not yours. It belongs to God. Uh, we, we'll look at more. hundred percent doesn't belong to you. <laughs> it belongs to God. It's a stewardship matter. But ten percent is what we're talking about. We're talking about that part. The tithe belongs to God. And... To the point that the Lord in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3 verse number 8, God uses strong language and he said that if you don't tithe on your income, you're robbing God. That means he's the owner of it. It belongs to him. It's not even ours. So there's tithing before the law. There's tithing under the law. And then there's tithing after the law is given in the New Testament. Here, here's the popular statement that we hear in our day. We no longer have to tithe because that was for those who are under the Old Testament law. And we are in the New Testament times under grace. You ever heard that? Yeah, there's a lot of teaching on it. Let me say, the Old Testament ceremonial law has been done away with. Animal sacrifices, uh, Old Testament feasts, all of the very feast, Passover, all of those feasts, feast of first fruits, all of those feasts that were given to Israel, they're passed away. The Saturday Sabbath with its laws are passed away. Old Testament ceremonial law done away with. But the moral law and many other laws 
are still binding for New Testament Christians. How do I know what's what? Well, let me give you some truths, truths to help us to know what's what. Well, what about there, that passage in the Old Testament and that passage in the Old Testament? Let me give you some simple truths that are vital and important when you study your Bible now. If an Old Testament law is repeated in the New Testament, then it is recognized as binding on New Testament Christians. The Word of God in the New Testament over and over again says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Right? Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. All kinds of passages. All of that is as binding as it has ever been. The moral law of God to us. So, if the law is repeated in the New Testament, it's binding. Then, if an Old Testament law has been set aside or changed in the New Testament, it's no longer binding on us. You say, like what? Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council, they met together and wrestled with the question, do New Testament saved Gentiles have to be circumcised? It's an Old Testament commandment, isn't it? And yet, the conclusion is clear. They do not have to be circumcised. It's no longer binding. It's set aside for New Testament Christians. The Old Testament Jewish festival days and Saturday Sabbath with its rules are no longer binding. Colossians chapter 2 verse number 16. Listen to the verse. It says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. So they're not binding, those Old Testament days. Old Testament taught that you, shouldn't, that you couldn't eat certain fish. You're in trouble, Ken, probably. The fish eater. Uh, the, uh, there were certain meats you couldn't eat. And yet 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3, 4 and 5 clearly tells us that there are those who are forbidding you to eat meat. And yet we're to go ahead and receive it with thanksgiving. And prayer. Pray over it. And go ahead and have a pork chop. Right? <laughs> Just make sure you cook it well. <laughs> Don't eat it raw now. It tends to be parasitic, you know. <laughs> so, what do we have? We have stuff in Old Testament that's set aside. Don't we? We're just trying to determine about tithing, of course. Uh, what, what else? There are Old Testament laws that are not mentioned in the New Testament but are still binding on the Christian. Like take for instance, I can take Deuteronomy 22 and 5 where God said for a man to wear that which pertains to a woman and a woman wear that which pertains to a man is an abomination. And that just tells me what God thinks about a unisex movement. And it certainly would apply today about the transgender movement. A man's supposed to be a man and a woman's supposed to be a woman. However you're born, that's what you're supposed to be. And quit playing games about it. I've got a piece that came from Hillsdale College that is a great, great piece. It talks about who started the transgender movement and the particular three who were involved in starting it. And they said that it is a social construct this thing of men and women. It's a social construct. It's just something we've come up with as a society. Well, the problem is, how come it's gone on like this for 6,000 years? <laughs> and now all of a sudden, you, oh no, it's a social. No, it's not a social construct. It's God creating you to be what he created you to be. 
And there are some New Testament presidents, of course, too, that says, like we studied in 1 Corinthians 11, where there ought to be hair distinctions. And there was even clothing distinctions between them. Now, that'll vary in various societies, but there's still to be distinction between them. A man's to be a man. A woman is to be a woman. So, some, some are not mentioned so much in the New Testament, but they're still binding. Uh, in uh, another truth, if an Old Testament law is not mentioned in the New Testament, you look for general principles in the New Testament to, to determine what God requires of you uh, in that law. So those are just general principles. We, we can apply that. We, we can preach whole message just on those little thoughts. But they're vital for us as we study our Bible. So what about tithing? Tithing after the Old Testament, after the law of God. Is it repeated in the New Testament? Jesus talks about it in Matthew 23, 23. We're going to look two places. 1 Corinthians 9 and Matthew 23. Matthew 23, 23. Listen to what Jesus said. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. It's evident that he's rebuking the religious Jews there. And he says, for you pay tithe of mint and anise, that is dill, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, like judgment, I think I take that to mean right judgment. Just being able to judge what's right. Yeah, they, they're not judging right. They, they New Testament, the, they don't, the Pharisees, scribes, Pharisees, don't do well at judging what's right. Even though they're meticulous about the smallest little herb or spice they've grown in their garden, make sure you tithe on it. And so Jesus rebukes them. And he says, says you know, you, you've omitted these weightier matters that you need. And then he said this, these ought you to have done and not leave the other undone. He says, these you ought to have done. What? Tithe. Jesus said it. And not left the other things undone. 1 Corinthians 9. We've already looked at this passage, but uh, look, look what we see here in this passage in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 6. It's talking about Christian liberty, right? And Paul said, he and Barnabas, they have the right to, as, as missionary church planners, and of course he's been the Corinthian church's pastor previously, he said, we've got the right to demand to receive compensation and pay. Right? That's his argument. And, and of course he argues, he said, but I'm not, because I just don't want to stump the block here, there, and so on. Verse number 7. He said, who giveth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who, what soldier goes to war and he has to pay for the thing? He said, oh no, somebody else is paying. He said, uh, who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feeds a flock? What shepherd eats not of the milk of the flock? Of course he's going to get compensated. And then he goes on and says, say I these things as a man... Or saith not the law. The same also. And now you know what he does? He takes Deuteronomy 25 and 4 and quotes the Old Testament law. And he said, for it's written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. He's out there harvesting and plowing and stuff. And the ox... He can feed the corn. Let him eat it. Don't put anything over his mouth where he can't get to it. Provide. Doth God take care for the oxen? 
Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, and he's talking about the word of God, right? That's their work to tell you what God says. Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? And that's talking about material finances or supply, whatever. And then it goes on in verse number 13. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And he brings up the temple. And we've already mentioned Nehemiah 13. Other Old Testament passages are very clear that the tithe was to take care of the Levites and those who were ministering at the house of God. The temple. It was a tithe. And that's why God rebuked them in Nehemiah 13. So now Paul brings up this very point. He said, think about the Old Testament house of God. It said, uh, don't you know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? You know what happens? A sacrifice comes. You know where that meat went? The ones that weren't total burn offerings. The meat went to those who were ministering. The priests and the Levites. And the house of God. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Now look at verse number 14. Here's the punchline. Even so. Even so. In like manner. Hath the Lord ordained. That they which preach the gospel. New Testament. Right? Should live of the gospel. That is simply to say. That they should be supported financially. And he brings the point of comparison. By saying. Just like they did at the temple. Even so like that. Which primarily. Is by time. Oh, and the old, yeah, the temple, the reason that the Levites got tended to and the priests got tended to and all those kind of things it was because God said in the Old Testament, just give what you feel is right for you. You're, huh? That's not what he said. He set up a specific method for taking care of what he promised to build. His church. And the commission. And it starts. With tithing. Let me give you several bullet points. And we're done this morning. Tithing. Recognizes. That I am. Not the owner. Of anything. God is the owner, and I'm a mere steward. I'm just managing the affairs of God. Whatever he's given me. Which, of course, means that I'll also give an account about how I've managed that. Because he's the owner. The Lord owns it all. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all they that dwell therein. Haggai 2, 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Exodus 19, 5, all the earth is mine, the Lord says. Deuteronomy 8, 18, 
But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. And the idea, of course, is not uh, like modern TV preaching stuff that says, oh yeah, mansions and you're going to be a millionaire and all that. No, no, no. It's just talking about God's the one who gives you the opportunity to prosper and to be able to have what you need and to get supplied. You say, how so? He's the one that gave you opportunity wherever the door opened. He's the one that gave you a mind that still has the capacity to reason and think and plan. He's the one who gave you a measure of health in your body so that you can still function. God did it. We're told. And then God doesn't ask for a dime until he's already given you a dollar. That's right. Listen to Ecclesiastes 5, verse 18, 19. Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all of his labor, that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him. For it is his portion. God's given you a portion. God's given me a portion in his good providence. Every man also to whom God hath given, hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. God gives it to us. So you know what that means? God gives me a dollar. Mm, that's a test of my obedience. What am I going to do with that dime? It's a test of my trust. It's also a test of my thanksgiving. David wanted to build the temple. He took an offering. Listen to what he said in 1 Chronicles 29, 14. He said, Of thine own hand, talking to the Lord, Of thine own hand, we have given thee. He just fully acknowledges that God gave it to him. And we're just giving it back what you gave to us. The Lord says in Malachi 3.10, I love it. Prove me now herewith. Put me to the test. Put me to the test. I know of a preacher. A fellow was on hard times, fell on hard times, and, and he, quit, he quit tithing. And so he talked to the preacher. He said, you know, he said, I just want to tell you, here's what, what I've done, and I don't know, it just can't. So the preacher then said, how about if you get in a hard spot, you tithe, start tithing, and if you get in a hard spot, I'll cover it. The preacher said, I'll cover it. You tithe and just, we'll see how all that works out. And he said, okay, I'll do it. Then the preacher made application. He said, are you telling me that you trust, trust me more than you would trust God? <laughs> oh, a tricky preacher. <laughs> and then he saw. The man saw. Yeah. God can take care of things. Where I can't. Where a preacher can't. Where a parent can't. Where an employer can't. God can tend to things. We must conclude by saying that tithing brings God's blessing. It does. Malachi 3, 10 says, Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. 
and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God will bless, does bless, he promised to bless tithing. Didn't promise to make you rich. Like the TV evangelist heresy. But he does promise Philippians 4.19. The, the whole context of Philippians, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, is in the context of giving. It is. We might look at that a minute tonight. Matthew 6.33. Larry's Calix, one of his favorite verses, says, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Give the first tenth. That's what he calls for. And see if I'll not tend to you about all these other things, these other needs. God will do it. He will. There's a call in Malachi uh, to return. Verse number 7 says, Even from the days of your fathers you've gone away from my ordinances and not have kept them. God's ordered these things this way. And then he says, Return unto me and I will return unto you. Just return to God's ways. And see if God doesn't show up in special fashion. In all these matters. Giving. Giving. Tithes. In tithes and offerings. We'll look at offerings tonight because that's what 1 Corinthians 16 is about. It's about offerings. That's different. And we'll see it. We have to have this foundation of tithing first. And see what that just establish that it's so in a generation that says they don't want it. Get your song, trust, try and prove me. Let's close with this song. Let's stand. Here's one can. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Your money, talents, time, love. Concentrate the call upon the altar. While your Savior from above speaks sweetly, trust me, try me. Prove me, say the Lord, host and see if a blessing and measure blessing, I will not pour out me. In my way through faith and trials falter, when his guiding hand I can.
Amen. Anyone have a word to say? Anything to say? Oh, it's important to understand God's ways, isn't it? God's word. You say, let's just forget it. I, the one thing I guess that First Corinthians has done for me, it just keeps dealing with this and that and something else, and it's just one thing and boom and a boom and a boom and another boom. <laughs> and so, which has been good for me. I know that. Anybody else? Anybody? Brother Steve Hall, dismiss us, please.